So next we have um, uh, someone, a presenter from the Radio Jove community. Uh, this is Dr. Shing Feng, and uh, he's a NASA scientist. And I was actually first introduced to Radio Jove when I was an undergraduate. So that was some of my very first experience with citizen science. And um, Shing is, has a very nice uh, presentation um, that even though Radio Jove, their main mission is to look at radio emissions from Jupiter, uh, he's looking at HF spectral signals and identified a very interesting feature that I think um, everyone in this group will appreciate. So go ahead, Shane. Okay, thank you, Nathaniel, for uh, the nice introduction. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the work that I've been working on with a group of citizen scientists associated with the Radio Joe program. Uh, you see a lot of uh, co-authors on this uh, slide here. Uh, everybody can see my slides okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, everyone who is not associated with the university or Goddard are the citizen scientists uh, participants in this group. Uh, let me first uh, say a little bit about the Radio Joe program, uh, which started out um, oh, more than 20 years ago as an educational and outreach project started at Goddard. Uh, with what is called the direction, uh, director of discretionary funds, sort of internal funds that uh, support these educational effort. So the project consists of um, participants building a radio receiver kit, which is fairly low cost still. Um, so over the years, uh, they have distributed over 2,400 kits. And I understand the latest count is pushing 2,450 now. Um, so, as Nathaniel uh, mentioned, the uh, object of the exercise is to observe Jupiter, the Sun, and the galaxy. So hopefully with the building of the radio receiver kit, so the participant will get hands-on experience with radio astronomy. So at the same time, and they can learn about observing the, the cosmos, and so to speak. Uh, with the group, there is a subgroup of people who are uh, actually more sophisticated than the regular participants. They actually operate a, a spectrograph um, uh, unit, which actually takes spectrogram instead of the single frequency of uh, the traditional radio Joe receiver. So in the last few years, uh, we have uh, started with uh, partnering with the NASA Space Science Education Consortium, which is an education uh, uh, consortium that, that, that does uh, public outreach and try to, try to promote the heliophysics uh, to the community and try to use heliophysics as a medium to uh, firm up uh, STEM education. So we partner with them and uh, so, and with the specific extension of Radio Jove scope to include uh, citizen science research. So uh, what we're gonna talk about is uh, how we're gonna start doing that. Um, I'm not advancing the slide for some reason. But that works. Okay, um, as I mentioned, the subgroup, the spectrograph users group, operate uh, a FSX swept frequency uh, spectrograph. And currently we have about nine stations distributed across the US, including Hawaii and, and Alaska. So this is a spec, uh, swept frequency spectrograph. And uh, we're trying to develop a network of low cost receiver uh, to, to make a network, just like what Hamsai has tried to do, uh, to develop a network of receiver to, to make observations and try to do some science with the data. So in developing our phase one network, uh, what we have done is upgrading every uh, different stations with uh, calibrations and, and timing accuracy so that uh, every station would be performing at the same level. So we actually now have an operational phase one, if you will, if you will but we're still doing testing and, and checking on comparing data and that sort of stuff. Uh, but we're also looking in the future to develop our phase two, 
uh, our phase two development will be based on SDR units. Uh, currently, there are a number of um, team members are working with the SDR plays and some other SDR units to identify what is the best uh, unit for us uh, to work with. So of course, the idea of going to the SDR is the low cost and, and perhaps more capable unit. And therefore, we can uh, build more stations that way. Uh, uh, I, in, I understand that some of our team members has already talked to uh, some of the Tangerine SDR developers. So potentially, we can probably work together and come up with a workable unit, both for hem size purposes and for Radio Jove uh, observations purposes. Well, I, I don't have a picture for you, but I can uh, show you a, the antenna configuration that's being used by the uh, subgroup. Uh, the spectrograph worked off of a, a 7.3 meter uh, square uh, TFD arrays. So the arrays are connected to a quarter wave uh, coupler, uh, a hybrid, which then takes both the uh, right hand circularly polarized wave and the left hand waves uh, together, but uh, at different times. So uh, in a nutshell, I, I, this is the, the, um, the uh, specification for the spectrum analyzer. The frequency range we're working with is 15 to 30 megahertz. Uh, the reason for this is that because uh, for the most part, the group wanted to observe uh, Jovian radio emission. And this is right in the, uh, in the middle of the uh, Jovian decametric radiation. So uh, the frequency are uh, put into different channels and each band has 30 kilohertz uh, uh, bandwidth. And we're stepping in frequency by 50, 50 kilohertz. And the unit would sweep at 2000 channels per second. So that gives uh, roughly the dwell time on integration time per channel is about half a millisecond. And typically we would run 300 channels between 15 to 30 megahertz. So that gives you uh, with the two uh, polarization output, the time resolution would be 300 millisecond or 0.3 second per spectrum in both polarization. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the TP. So this is the characteristic feature of the TP has the upper, oops, has the upper cutoff frequency increasing with time and decreasing with time afterwards. What we're showing here is a dynamic spectrum uh, with frequency increasing from uh, here is a 16 all the way up to 30 or so megahertz. And the horizontal axis is time. So the time scale for one of these things is uh, well, a few hours, okay, at the bottom. So, and then it forms the triangular shape feature. So that's why we call it the TP, it looks like a TP tent. In this example, it's actually two TPs observed simultaneously in Florida and in New Mexico. So, and that's very interesting because, uh, well, we don't see these all the time, but sometimes we, we, we get lucky. So we are able to detect a TP simultaneously. I actually don't know, I can't tell you that these actually have the same source, but given the time signature, they have the same time for the apex frequencies. So if you assume that, uh, the same source produced the TPs for the very uh, widely separated uh, stations. And the simplest thing to do is maybe put a, put a source in the middle. The two stations are separated by over 2,000 kilometers. So somewhere in the middle is 1,000 kilometers would be the source location. So that makes it a very interesting um, scenario. So what could produce this uh, TP signature? TPs are observed not, not only in isolation, but they're also seen in groups. In this case, uh, we call it a nested TP, which is uh, you see a TP here, and then at a higher frequency, you see another TP. So they look like a nested or tower uh, distribution of, of TP signature. And another one over here, and you can see that, in fact, uh, the one with lower 
apex frequency tends to be a little stronger than the ones with higher apex frequencies. The color scale are, are just as so that I can, I can actually emphasize the TP feature, but if you um, bring up the color scale a little bit more, you can see that this is actually the galactic radio background, same as over here. Okay, so here's the nested TPs, uh, but there's times you can also see TPs in a series. Over here is a, a 12 hour spectrogram and you can see a series of TP that continues on and then it, it ends uh, toward the end of the day. So whatever mechanism can produce the, C, the TP uh, signature, not only that it has to produce the isolated TP, but it, it has to also explain why we sometimes get the nested TP or sometimes TPs in the series. Uh, this enhanced feature up here is around 27 megahertz. Those are the C, uh, CB bands interference. And some of the other discrete bands are also radio interference. Okay, so if, if we could put some of these things with a more geophysical context, we're gonna start looking at some of these TP observations uh, relative to, well, what is the rest the magnetosphere is doing? So the, the simplest thing for me to, do, to have done is to look at uh, the occurrence of, of these uh, TP features uh, during the times of, you know, asking what is the geomagnetic condition of, uh, during that time. So on the um, right is uh, the top panel is what is called the KP index. The KP index is measured over three hour interval and it measures the global geomagnetic disturbance uh, of the, over the earth or uh, the magnetosphere. The second panel is the DST index. Uh, some of you may be familiar with. It measures the strength of the ring current. In other words, it, it tells you how stormy the magnetosphere is during that time. And the index below is the AE index, and it measures the auroral activities. So in this particular event, it's actually pretty quiet. Okay, so KP uh, has a scale from basically zero to nine, and this is actually less than two. Uh, the vertical scale here, the, I got this from Omni, uh, their KP value is 10 times the KP value. So if you, if you divide this by 10, you get the traditional KP value. So the spectrogram on, on the left is a 10 hour interval. So the same 10 hour interval is marked on the right. And you can see the KP is actually very, very quiet. And it, it only is, um, marches up to maybe just below two toward the end of the day. And DST is slightly positive and it's certainly nothing to write home about. And the AE index, the aurora activity is exceedingly quiet for the most part of this interval that we're talking about. It only went up to maybe well, below 300. It's still pretty quiet in terms of aurora activities. So this is actually a quiet time um, event. So uh, the one more thing I want to do is to zoom in on, on uh, this part of the, of the spectrum to see what it looks like uh, when you look close up. And I'm not able to advance there. Okay. So now the next panel here is one hour of this particular event. And you can start seeing some of the uh, fine scale structure uh, over, the, over the top, which is the, um, the cutoff frequencies. If you zoom in some more, this is a 20 minute interval. And at last, this is a two minute interval. So this is the same event, zooming in in succession from 10 hours to two minutes. What you see is a series of discrete bursts. So the discrete bursts are seen occasionally during quiet times. So that if you just look at this slide, that's what it suggests. So during quiet times, you tend to see these things, discrete bursts. So the only natural uh, source that I could think of that could produce these discrete bursts is probably lightning flashes. So that's, uh, that's how I'm going to start thinking about these things as lightning 
produced radiation. So next, I'm going to show you another event, which is during moderate times, moderate activities. So here, this is an event occurs uh, when Kp is up to about four. So again, this is a 12 hour interval, the same 12 hour interval, and you can see that Kp is now four. DST went slightly negative, but it didn't quite go down to a storm type condition. So this is still above DST minus 20. The AE index here, uh, because of this time, in uh, 2019, we actually do not yet have the definitive AE index. So I went and looked up the uh, provisional AE index. That's what this is. And you can see that the AE index actually at times, do, even during this 12 hour interval, it at times went up to 1,000. So uh, you, you would be expecting some aurora activities at this time. So this is a case when you have a moderately disturbed magnetosphere going on and we still see this uh, TP signature and then this is the, the CP enhancement. Again, do the same thing with zoom in on the same two minutes. Now the picture looked very different. It looks like hash, but in between the diffuse signature, you also still see these relatively still discrete but not continuous bursting. So it was seen now that uh, the diffuse appearance may imply significant ionospheric scattering because uh, during geomagnetic active time, the ionosphere is disturbed and then you're more likely to produce irregularities um, in the ionosphere, causing scattering of the signal, producing this diffuse looking appearance in the TP signature. Okay. So next, we're going to look at uh, a possible generation mechanism of the TP. This is a familiar picture for uh, most of you. So all it says is that you have a, a transmitter or radiation source of some sort. You produce the high frequency waves, some of which would propagate upward toward the ionosphere. The dash line is, um, indicates the bottom side of the ionosphere. So above the bottom side ionosphere, you have a density gradient with electron density increasing upward, up to a point to maybe the F, the critical layer. And then the upward propagating wave at whatever um, incident angle at the bottom side ionosphere is going to refract continuously up to a point and then refract backward and come back down to Earth. So this is the traditional picture uh, back in the 20s, and this, this uh, configuration has been well studied, certainly in terms of radio communications. So the, there's a theorem called the Bright and Tooth Theorem, which says this continuous process of refraction can be replaced by a simple specular reflection at a virtual height. Okay. So from now on, I'm just gonna replace this refraction process by this simple reflection at a virtual height. Um, okay. Well, all, all I'm trying to do here, uh, let me go back. So uh, with this configuration, what we can do is that we can calculate the range uh, let's say if you're standing right here with your source, you can calculate for any upward propagating radio wave, what is the range for that wave as a function of frequency and uh, incident angle at the bottom side of the ionosphere. So that's the result in the next page. So all I'm trying to show is that you can calculate the range as a function of this angle theta sub zero and the normalized frequencies. And all of this is a function of this Y sub M, which is the density gradient above the bottom side ionosphere. Since we're talking about a potentially large range where D is very large, if D is large, you need to take care of, you need to take into account the curvature of the surface and therefore also the curvature of the ionosphere. So the equation on the top gives you the range formula 
for a flat surface, stratified ionosphere, and the bottom equation gives you the same quantity, but taking into account of the curvature of the system. So with these two equations, I can now produce a set of curves. So this now is the range D in the vertical axis as a function of angle theta zero for various frequencies. So X here is the frequency parameter normalized to the critical frequency of the reflection layer, okay? And the, the panel on the top gives you the flat earth case. The uh, panel on the bottom gives you the, the spherical earth case. So in both cases, you can see that these uh, frequency curves has this U-shaped structure, so I just call them U-curves. And in fact, um, this actually shows the, uh, the calculation of the maximum useful frequency at the bottom of the U. So here are the U-curves. So each U-curve is a frequency, the normalized frequency, and the U minimum gives you the MUF for that range. And um, so the rays that are above theta zero are what is now called the low angle ray, and the rays below the critical angle, the minimum angle U is the is the high angle rays, okay? Okay, so since this is a well-studied problem, uh, in fact, back in the 60s, people have already done ray tracing calculations of this scenario. So what's being shown here is, is a figure I have adopted from uh, Croft 67 in JGR. So what we had done, what he had done is a 2D ray tracing calculation for a fixed transmitter location so he would launch rays at different angle of elevation. So then he would compute the ground range for that ray. So using the um, bright and tooth theorem before, and you can see that this is the, uh, the black dots indicates the apex or the virtual reflection point. So as a function of angle, uh, the, the locus, of the virtual reflection point traces out a U or a V, if you will. So this locus of the um, of the virtual reflection point is called the reflectrix. So you can you can draw a set of reflectrix at different frequencies. So each one of these curve has one frequencies. And it turns out these reflectrices. Uh, correspond exactly to the U-curves that we had before, because every one of these U-curves is a frequency, okay? So in fact, you, if you look at the U-curves, they have exactly the same structure as the reflectrices. So, and now it, it, makes, it makes it very uh, convenient to interpret the data. So this picture here is a static picture with a fixed transmitter. But if you are sitting at the receiver location, which is fixed to the ground, uh, instead of you, you moving, but the source is actually moving. If the source is moving, that means that the angle of uh, elevation or the angle of incidence at the bottom side of the ionosphere has to be changing uh, with time. So in that case, that situation is represented by this blue line. So this blue line said, as I cut across this frequency structure, I would be going from low frequency to high frequency to a highest frequency, and then come back out to a low frequency to a low frequency, which is exactly what we would observe in the dynamic spectrum. Layer. So that in a nutshell is, is what we think is what's going on in terms of explaining the, uh, the creation of the um, TP signature. So uh, that's what that is. Okay. So we can summarize. So what we think now is the TP signature that we observe 
in the uh, dynamic spectrogram mm -hmm. is, is a propagation effect from um, perhaps distant lightning storms. And as I mentioned, you have to explain, uh, the same mechanism has to explain why you have groupings of, of the TPs. So for the nested TPs, nesting of the TPs is probably coming from a line of thunderstorms. Uh, it's propagating, it, it's being viewed by your antenna beam. So your antenna beam is actually getting radio signal from uh, lightning storm at, the, at different distances with a line of uh, thunderstorm. So for the case of a series, the TP series could be a line of thunderstorm just uh, moving across your, uh, your antenna beam. With uh, modeling, we could potentially use these TP signature uh, to, to remotely sense or, or understand or, or model the height of the bottom side ionosphere, the density layer, and the critical frequencies. And lastly, as I mentioned before, uh, depending on the geomagnetic conditions, uh, you have different amount of, of ionospheric irregularities. So by looking at the degree of diffuseness of the discrete burst, if you will, uh, we might be able to start learning something about uh, how irregular or how disturbed the ionosphere is. Okay, so I think that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. I really appreciate it. And again, a virtual applause to you <laughs> on behalf of all of the panelists and attendees.